There are a large number of discrepancies between the redshift of quasars and how far away they actually are. Mainstream science believes that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between the redshift and its recessional velocity, and hence how far away these objects are from us. This implies that quasars are some of the oldest and most distant objects in the cosmos. The problem is that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this notion is wrong. It is high time we examine credible theories to explain how this redshift could be higher for these objects. Holt and Arp catalogued many of these objects. In the video on why we can't trust Redshift, I examined some of the evidence that Holt and Arp and his colleagues catalogued to underpin the notion that Redshift is not only created by an object's movement relative to us. It is now time that we look more deeply into what mechanisms could cause this shift in the spectral emission to cause such a Redshift without requiring high recessional velocities. In order to understand some of these theories, it is important for us to understand the current beliefs on what quasars actually are. Now, quasars are star-like objects which have many unusual properties. They emit a non-thermal continuum spectrum of radiation and emission lines that are highly redshifted. It is believed that they have axial rather than spherical symmetry and at the centre is a very dense object which is often referred to as the central engine. In many mainstream models this would be a black hole with an accretion disk which would radiate. To date no one has been able to confirm that any quasar has a black hole at its centre. The radiation from this engine would then excite gaseous clouds which would emit line radiation. Now, usually they are thought to be two types of clouds surrounding them a broad line region and a narrow line region, which will emit spectral lines of different widths. In the Electric Universe and the Plasma Universe model, the engine is likely to be a plasmoid, which is being fed by an active Birkeland current or a current sheet. Again, it is likely that this would be surrounded by a partially ionized plasma cloud. For simplicity's sake, we are going to assume that there is a simple driving engine surrounding a dusty plasma cloud, rather than worrying about what that engine actually is. Now, there are a number of different ways that the emitted light could be shifted, so let's examine them and discuss each one in turn. Now, the first one, obviously, is recessional velocity. So here, an object would move away from us and that motion would cause the light waves to become stretched. This is the classic Doppler shift. So this is where we get the notion that uh, if it's shifted, it implies that the object is moving away from us. Obviously, if it's moving towards us, the waves get compressed and you end up with blue shift. Now, related to this is cosmological redshift. So here, it is not necessarily the objects that are moving, but it is the space in between it. So space is expanding, and the light is traveling through this space, and while space is expanding, it will do the same effect as we discussed before, it will end up stretching the light. So therefore, when we look up and we see the majority of things being redshifted, it implies, therefore, that the universe must be expanding. So those first two are used by astronomers when they examine galaxies and objects like that to determine their age and their distance because the assumption is that the further away they are, the quicker that they must be traveling and therefore the more stretched that light is, whether that is due to the space itself expanding or the object itself moving away from us. It doesn't really matter. Now there is a third mainstream model which doesn't often get talked about which is called a gravitational shift. Now this was first discovered by Einstein and it occurs when there is a difference between the gravitational potential in the vicinity of the source and the gravitational potential in the vicinity of the observer. Now this has been experimentally verified both in the laboratory and through measurements made of stars and much more recently of galaxy clusters which clearly showed a shift from the centre to the edge, where the centre would be more redshifted than the edge. 
However, if we look at quasars, it is unlikely to account for that redshift change. There isn't a big difference in potential when we look at these objects. Now, there are other theories, tested theories, which could explain some of the reasons why we see redshift. So let's run through some of those and explain how they work and how they might apply to quasars in particular. So let's start firstly with the Compton effect. And this is an effect which is caused due to the scattering effect of electrons. The problem with this effect is that the, the redshift is dependent on the wavelength of the incident radiation. And on top of this, it will actually cause a blurring effect to the spectral lines which is not what we observe when we look at quasars. The next one is the Brillouin and Raman scattering. Both of these effects produce changes in wavelength due to the interactions with excitations of internal degrees of freedom of the scattering medium, such as rotational excitations of molecules or vibrations of a crystal. The problem is that both of these produce complex spectra which would have repeated patterns, which again is not what we see when we observe the quasars. The next one, which is one we've talked about before, is the variable mass hypothesis. Now, this is a purely hypothetical model in which the mass of the electron changes over time. And this means that when it has less mass, it is not able to produce the higher frequency wavelengths and therefore would appear to be redshifted. This theory would be able to explain the observed effects, but so far no one has actually verified whether this effect actually happens in a laboratory. Next up is the Wolf effect. This is the name given to several closely related phenomena in radiation physics, dealing with a modification of the power spectrum of a radiated field due to the spatial fluctuations of the source of the radiation. Now, Wolf was a physicist specialising in optics. His paper on this concept quickly caused others to realise that this effect could mimic Doppler and therefore redshift. Now, laboratory experiments were able to confirm that this shift could indeed lead to large observed redshift. It did, however, require some strict conditions to be met. It requires the scattering medium to have a large coherence length in one direction compared to the other. And this does actually fit well with the current model of the quasar. So when we examine the quasar, we would see that at the center is our engine, which is causing the um, initial emission of radiation through that plasma cloud that sits surrounding it. That cloud then excites um, the, the cloud that we're talking about, the one that's long and thin, and that would cause a scattering effect. And that scattering effect, depending on where the observer is, would cause us to perceive a redshift. And this redshift could indeed match the observations that we see. And there are a number of papers that discuss this in more detail. And again, I will include the links that you can look at those. Next up is plasma redshift. Now this is a theoretical redshift mechanism which occurs when a photon enters a hot sparse electron plasma. Now normally when photons enter a cold or a dense electron plasma they would lose energy through ionization and excitation through Compton scattering on the visual electrons and through Raman scattering on the plasma frequency. When the plasma is very hot and has a low density, for example in the solar corona, the photons would lose energy through what is called plasma redshift. And in this process the photon loses a portion of its energy to the plasma, causing a significant heating effect. And there is some evidence to suggest that this has been confirmed in laboratory experiments. And if this is true, this theory would have some very major implications for cosmology. And because of that, I will be producing a separate video going into the detail of this uh, very soon. So from this, we can see that there are two strong alternatives for producing redshift that we see from quasars and other objects in the universe as well. The, the Wolf effect 
has most definitely been confirmed in the laboratory. The, the problem with the wolf effect is it, it really does only apply to the likes of quasars. And you couldn't really apply the same mechanism to galaxies. Um, I mean, it, you could as long as it met those conditions that we talked about before. But in, in effect, it would have to be very young galaxies rather than large galaxies. And the problem is that we do see galaxies which have red sifts, which are anomalous. So this method wouldn't necessarily explain all of them. However, it would possibly explain why we see such large shifts for quasars, because there is potentially an additional effect that we are observing on top of it. Now, the plasma redshift one, I am quite intrigued by. Again, I need to do some more research into this to understand exactly how it works. Um, there are papers that suggest that they have confirmed this in the laboratory, but until I read them in more detail, I'm not 100% sure that this is the case. Because if this is the case, if there really truly is something called plasma redshift, then a lot of the, the concepts of an expanding universe go out the door. Because what we would be seeing in terms of the um, cosmic background radiation, in terms of the fact that you know most of the galaxies are moving away from us, would be refuted. The, the explanation would be from this effect, therefore implying that we are in a, in a more static universe and that it potentially is an infinitely um, static universe. As we've discussed before when we looked at um, some of the alternatives to the Big Bang Theory. And on that note, I will leave you to ponder the consequences of that. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.